Welcome, everybody. We'll be starting today's very cool presentation in a couple of minutes. Okay, people, we are at the two minute mark. So let's get this started, shall we? Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for our weekly Improving Talks. Today's guest of honor is none other than David O'Hara, president of Improving's Dallas office and all around the nicest human being at the company. And I'm willing to bet on it. As president of Improving, David finds his joy in facilitating those around him to discover what they need to grow and achieve their best selves. David continues to propel the growth of the company, achieving the 11th consecutive listing on the Inc. 5000 fastest growing companies in America, and also maintains the legacy of significant culture by being awarded best place to work in Dallas for 10 years in a row. His experience in going from early stage startup to exit and beyond have given him a perspective of what it takes to build a great culture that is financially sound and sustainable. And as you know, our people and culture are very important parts of the company, if not the most important one. For all of the above, I can't really think of someone better to talk to us about building blocks of a conscious culture, which is the name of our presentation. Before we start, remember that we have a Q&A feature so you can ask questions at any time, which I'll be reading to him. And without further ado, I leave you with David O'Hara as he takes us on this journey to learn more about creating a culture that drives success and enriches lives by aligning with conscious capitalism. The microphone is yours, David. Thank you, Armando. Uh, and thank you everybody for, for joining us. Uh, I'm excited to talk about uh, culture. It is a big topic for me and, and something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, so I, I intend to walk us through and, and talk a little bit about uh, a conscious culture, what that looks like, and uh, to show you some of the things that we've learned, some of the models that we've put together. And uh, I'll preface this with something that Ben Kennedy, one of our Dallas improvers, likes to likes to say uh, regularly is, you know, all models are wrong in some way, but many are useful. And so my hope is that you will see our model not as a mandate of perfect or entirely correct, so much as a, a way to help you think about what it looks like to build culture and, and how you might go about it. So I want to start off uh, talking about conscious capitalism for those who are, uh, are maybe not familiar or as familiar. Conscious capitalism uh, is this idea that your business exists for a, should exist for a purpose greater than just making money. You need to be profitable as a business to stay in business. And so it, it really is your lifeblood, but it shouldn't be your purpose. And purpose is that first of the four pillars of conscious capitalism. And our belief is that capitalism, specifically conscious capitalism, as you can see, is it's good. It is ethical. It is noble and heroic because of what it does for us as humans. Um, I mentioned those four pillars, purpose, stakeholder, conscious leadership, and conscious culture. And you can see a little bit about each of those pillars. 
Uh, if you want to learn more about conscious capitalism, you can go to consciouscapitalism.org. That's where the international site lives. But there are also chapters in so many of the geographies uh, around the world where communities of people are coming together to talk about these ideals and to talk about how to implement those ideals inside of our organizations to con continue to grow conscious businesses. So I would encourage you to find out more about conscious capitalism as a but then also connect with a community that helps you see how to practice it and what it looks like. So obviously of the four pillars, we are focusing in on the, the uh, culture one. And culture really is that uh, the way they just define it is this guiding principle and practices that underlie the so social fabric of a business. It's, it's how we connect all of the various pieces and parts of our organizations. Um, Forbes actually defines culture specifically as the shared values, belief systems, attitudes, and set of assumptions that people in the workplace share. Dave's definition is a little bit different. Culture really is the byproduct that's given off in that intersection of values and behaviors at work. So an example would be if you value if you value speed of and reward execution above everything else, you're going to have a very specific culture, right? And if you value collaboration and reward win-win outcomes, you're going to have a very different culture. And so it, it really is about um, what is it that you are looking to produce. Some people might say, "Oh, well, this is a good culture." or a bad culture. I know toxic tends to be another word that gets thrown around a lot when describing cultures, but these judgments really are made in the context of those behaviors and values, right? That's ultimately what makes up uh, a culture. So a couple of stats when we talk about why is culture important? Uh, there was a study by Deloitte that talked about 94% of it, uh, executives and 88% of employees be believe a distinct workplace culture is important to business success, right? So we have better business performance because of the culture that we have. When you have a that healthy culture, that alignment of values and behaviors. Additionally, there's correlation uh, between a clearly articulated and lived culture and, and that business performance. Uh, when you have culture that's not just, you know, words on the wall or these abstract ideas, and we're going to touch on that a little bit more here uh, in a minute, you have in increased employee engagement. People feel connected, connected to each other, connected to the organization. And Oftentimes when you have that purpose, they're connected to that purpose and they see meaning in what they do. And that's pretty uh, pretty important for folks. Uh, the last piece that, that came out of this Deloitte study was that employees, when they asked them to rank an importance, uh, they ranked very highly, cl clearly defined and communicated values and beliefs. Um, was on par with having clearly defined business strategy. So that culture was just as important as the business strategy for successful outcomes and for employees feeling like the place where they are working is meaningful in their lives. This can be very helpful when we're trying to retain the awesome people that we have. Uh, it also can help you to attract higher level talent because they see meaningful work that aligns with them and aligns with their values. So I mentioned that I was going to share uh, a model. And uh, this is the model that, that we've been uh, working, working towards. So culture is an interesting intersection between purpose and values and mindfulness. Um, you know, the word culture has a Latin root, cultus, which it shares with the word cultivate. And so I think about these three things, this mindfulness, values, and purpose, 
uh, similar to growing things in a garden, right? If I'm growing something and I don't know how many other folks like to, you know, get out and put your hands in the dirt and, and grow things, but it's something that I definitely enjoy doing and seeing the products of, of that, those efforts, but you got to have the right light. You got to have the right uh, soil. And then you have to water things. The right kinds of each of these though, depend on what is it you're trying to grow? So if you're growing tomatoes, you're going to need a little bit more acidity in the soil, kind of like roses. Um, if you're growing uh, potatoes, the, the soil is going to look different. Uh, some things need full sun, some things need shade. So recognizing these different components and how they interplay becomes really important when you're trying to build a culture. So let's focus on these pieces in order to kind of understand how they contribute to culture and some examples of how we might be able to intentionally build these ourselves. So first I wanna talk about values. Um, do you know your company's values? Remember my definition of, of culture, right? Was uh, that alignment of behavior and values becomes really important uh, to know whether or not those values are aspirational values or are they practiced values. You see here, improving values. We talk about our identity, excellence, involvement, and dedication. And these are very much practiced values for us. That second question becomes important when thinking about how did you arrive at the values? Oftentimes they'll have groups of people that'll sit around and say, oh, well, I think we value timeliness. You know, we value people's time. And then when you talk to the people in that organization, they're like, well, we never start meetings on time or we're always running over or we skip out on those sorts of things. And that might be an aspirational value, but it's not a practiced value. And it's only practiced values that can truly be felt and help in building your culture. So for us at Improving, the way we found our values was we did an exercise called uh, Mission to Mars. So Curtis, our CEO, took the group of folks that were in the company at the time and said, we're going to send a spaceship to Mars to recreate Improving as it exists today. The catch was there's only six seats on that spaceship. So who are the six people in this company that could recreate it on Mars? And so we went through this thought exercise and, and contributed names of who we thought we should be in it and so went through selection rounds until we came up with those six people. And then we pivoted the question to say, what is it about those six people that would make them successful in doing that? And we talked about things like they have integrity, they're motivated. They're willing to contribute and, and help out. They you know, hold us accountable and they do these different things. And so we wrote these things down. And as we were gathering all of these different attributes of the people that were in our organization, they ultimately grouped into three groups. And those three groups are where we got excellence, involvement, and dedication. Those attributes surrounded these words and were identified by how people were living them out in our organization. Here in Dallas, we actually have a morning stand-up. Uh, we have one, we've been doing it since the beginning of the company. We have it at 9 a.m. every morning and folks are willing to join. So we'll have folks from the delivery team that are on the bench. We'll have folks uh, from recruiting or from sales, myself. And we have a theme for each day. It's focused on something specific, but one day is specifically about values and trust. We talk about these regularly because it's what helps us internalize them, but it also helps us to recognize them. So I can recognize some of my coworkers or other improvers that are living out these behaviors and acting it out. And it really creates those strong fibers for us weaving a culture that has congruence between behaviors and values. It's it's how they show up or sometimes show off. It, it's different for different people in different roles, 
but there, there's consistency of these things throughout our organization. And so that really lends itself to that last question there of what values do people in your organization experience? Um, that's super important. So I'll talk about the next piece, the next component is purpose. What is your company's purpose? Do you have a purpose? Is it something bigger than just continuing as an organization, right? Profitability. Um, sometimes companies start with purpose already baked in, but to be honest, initially, a business's purpose is to survive. Uh, you have to make it to the next day and you do have to make it to profitability. That really is where you're focused. Although some attempt to put this in place earlier uh, and, and they say that they're they say that that's their purpose. Truly, their initial purpose is to just get to survivability, right? Get to a profitability. Once critical mass has been achieved, though, and, and you're moving, you can move to a more purposeful focus. Uh, I know sometimes if you move too soon, uh, you know, the company can can not go well. Uh, I've seen that happen. And so it's it's important to make sure that you're on sustainable footing so that you can serve that higher purpose. Um, once you have that purpose and you see right there improvings, ours is to change the perception of the IT professional. Well, what happens is this feeds the activities that the company values. It helps to, to shape what are the activities that we wanna see from people? What are the things that we're trying to do to align to that purpose? If we know what we are all heading towards, we can better figure out what we should be doing to get there, how it is that I can contribute to that overall purpose. Um, and that becomes very important. You know, when I mentioned before, we talk about um, attaining, uh, uh, retaining and acquiring talented people. Well, if I know that when I'm joining this organization, these things that I'm doing are going to matter and are going to help us move towards that purpose. Wow, what a powerful thing that is, right? Like, that's fantastic. And so since we're talking about purpose, your purpose should feel a little bit scary, unattainable maybe. You know, for us, like, will we, will we be able to change that perception? Like, can I change the perception of the IT professional? If you aim too low, you have to be careful right? You, you just might get it and you achieve it. And like, all right, now what do we do? Um, so you want it to be heady. You want it to be something grand. Um, but then you also, like I said, it helps you to figure out what are the activities that I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis that help us align towards changing that perception. For us here, Trust is a very big thing. If you go to our website, you see trust changes everything. It's written on the walls uh, in our offices. And the reason that is so crucial is because trust is something that I can practice each and every day. And if I become more trustworthy, I trust myself, my team trusts me, I trust them, our clients trust. When we grow that trust, it changes the perception of the IT profession, because I don't know if you know, but business and IT don't always uh, think that highly of each other. There's a rift of mistrust. Uh, there was an Entergage study that of over a thousand CEOs and they asked about trust with the various divisions of their organization. IT was the second least trusted behind sales. Lawyers, legal was number three. So even the lawyers beat IT in terms of levels of trust. And that's why we believe that we want to change that perception. And we want to do that by building trust and increasing trust across the organization, increasing trust in ourselves and in those around us. Will we ever achieve it completely? No, but that's part of the point. Right, You want to be able to strive for that purpose. You want it to be a challenge, something you can step up to each and every day and gives you that meaningful work. 
And then the third component of the this model, mindfulness. And this isn't about meditation and breathing, not that kind of mindfulness, although those things are great and useful. Uh, I practice them personally on a daily basis because they help me. Um, this is about intentionality, uh, being mindful of what it is you're doing. Your actions feed the culture and guide it in a specific direction. Uh, and so really... Uh, Think about it. Uh, are you guiding it in the direction that you want it to go? Not that you're going to get this perfect. Now, this goes back to trust. And sometimes we break trust. And so we have to say, I'm sorry. I have to right or wrong. I have to go back and make sure that we're steering it. Um, but if you want to be a learning organization, you need to feed that growth mindset. Uh, you need to think about how is it that we learn? Um, how does your culture respond to failure? That's a big one. And, and that's something that you can help control and that you can think about because it will shape your culture dramatically. Does your culture embrace experimentation? Right? We do experiments because we have a thesis and we want to try something and gather information, gather data. But oftentimes those experiments are unsuccessful right? They're failures. So how we deal with experimentation says a lot about our culture. Um, and then just recognizing your own part in the culture, that level of presence and, and that level of attention becomes a really important aspect that each of us can think about as we are contributing to our organization's culture. David, I have a question for you. Yep. Talking about mindfulness and our own contributions to the organization, what can I do from my side of the court to foster a successful good culture in the company other than sharing the values in your own words? Yeah, so I would say there's two things. Um, having strong relationships with other folks means that we can give each other feedback. And feedback is tremendously helpful. And I don't just mean feedback like, let me tell you the thing that you did wrong. Let me tell you the thing that you did right is feedback too. And so asking for feedback and giving feedback means that we help each other as we're aligning those values and behaviors to help build the culture. And so that's one aspect that I would say you can personally practice um, looking for and seeking feedback as well as giving feedback to our peers uh, can be very helpful in, in growing that. Uh, the second thing that I would say is looking at those values. And, you know, I mentioned uh, daily practices a, a minute ago. For me, journaling is another daily practice. And so writing out what I'm thinking about as I look at these values and just exploring that for myself is a type of mindfulness and it's a type of practice. Uh, and then you can even extend that into a gratitude practice of journaling who it is and what it is you're thankful for as you look at the values and, and the behaviors. Did that answer your question? It did. Thank you, David. So we're talking about communicating values. Um, we have this, if we have this concept of uh, of values, like how do we communicate those? So I read that you have to repeat something seven times for people to hear it. And I know I'm a high D in the disc. And so thinking about having to do something seven times over sounds like a lot to me. Oftentimes I might even quit after just one or two times. I just feel like I'm repeating myself, but you need to lean into that and you need to communicate these things. It's why I mentioned journaling as a practice. It's why I mentioned it for the stand-up, doing it over and over. There's tons of opportunities inside of your day to get those seven in. And it doesn't have to just be saying it over and over again. You know, people will remember what you did more than what you said. And so showing up and practicing those values yourself and living out those behaviors yourself becomes very impactful.
But I would also say, show the values. When you open your staff meetings, like put it up on the screen, uh, put it put it up in your regular town hall as the, one of the first slides. You, you do have regular town halls, right? Like that's an important part of, you know, showing this over and over again and, and living out those values, um, identifying those actions as and finding ways to showcase them in your space. Like, do you have a recognition wall? Do you have a way that people can celebrate each other? Uh, and do you have a way that people that come into your space see your values? And, and so that becomes a really important aspect in communicating them is the repetition. Because with the repetition, again, it starts to get uh, in you more and show up through you more. Since I'm talking about how those values show up and the actions, it becomes important to make sure that you're empowering your employees. You have to lead by example as the executive. You can't delegate culture. And, and I've seen this happen all the time. Organizations will have somebody come in and they're like, would you be the head of culture and have culture off in some uh, HR function? You can't do that. You're going to have a culture that's that's stunted and, and isn't lived out by everyone. Culture really comes down from, um, from folks. There's a saying that I have is your direct reports ability to experience your culture is directly correlated to your internalization of it. When you are living it out, they can experience it. If you're not living it out, they'll definitely experience that as well. Um, so I would say identify champions who these are the social gatekeepers. These are the culture, they're your culture champions. They're in every group. There are always those folks that are a little more vocal, um, that are a little doing a good job of living those out. Celebrate them, invite them to own specific areas and, and to share in, in varieties of ways. But then I also would say be sure to set clear expectations with guidance on autonomy. And we have a, uh, a fun exercise that we do. Maybe it's fun to me, uh, but an exercise that we do to help us define autonomy. A lot of people think that autonomy means you get to do whatever it is you want. Um, that's not a, autonomy. That's actually anarchy. Uh, and that's not what we're going for here. But we want folks to have autonomy. We just need to be able to give them guidance as to where it is they can make decisions. And so we, we do this exercise with four buckets. So you have four buckets to define autonomy. These are the activities that you can just do. Don't need permission. Please go and do. You have the second bucket, which is review with me. And we'll figure out what the right path forward is. The third bucket is ask me. And then the fourth bucket is avoid. Like these are the things absolutely don't do. Like don't go in that direction. There's only problems if we do that. But with that level of understanding, now both of us can operate in a healthy way and know that we are aligned in terms of where we are going. David, I have another question for you. Yep. It says, uh, sorry, I have it here. When buying other companies, can you share some of the biggest challenges culture-wise during the integration process that we faced and how we overcome them? Absolutely. Um, so I will talk first, I'll talk a little bit about how improving does acquisitions. So we've done 14 of them now uh, over the span of, of our organization. One of the things that we learned and, and I'm I'm quite proud of. Uh, Rick DeAnda, who leads our M&A team, is amazing at sharing culture and understanding their culture. And so he starts out all of those conversations with another company before we even move into financials and does the acquisition make sense, understanding their culture. So our acquisitions have been highly aligned with us from a culture perspective when we do them. So 
hats off to Rick. He's definitely been helpful in making this an easier transition for us. That said, we've learned a, a lot of things. There, there are several big challenges that we see when we're integrating cultures. One of them, I think, would go to what I was just speaking about was those buckets of autonomy, where if I'm in a startup and I'm in a smaller company, my four buckets of autonomy could look different than when I join an organization that's much, much larger. Um, we have this where you know I'm part of the group that helps start improving um, back in 2007. And so we got to do a whole bunch of jobs. I wore 12 different hats. Well, as we've gotten bigger, we have people who are really great at these things and really great at these things. And so now I'm just doing these things, which can feel like you're taking things away from me. But it's not that. It's that we've grown big enough now. We have people who are awesome at these other things. And now I may not have to do them. And so we, we get bigger by getting smaller. And sometimes that can feel like, I said, losing things, when in reality, it's just leaning into where my strengths are and where my contributions are. And so making sure that I have the right perspective of why it is my buckets have changed, my buckets of autonomy have shifted, have changed as I've moved from that entrepreneurial, smaller organization to a much larger entity. Thank you, David. That's great question. Yeah, and if you all have any other questions, feel free to, to lob them in. I would love to, love to share more. Um, oh, and then the last bullet point is we're talking about uh, employees and culture. Like the culture, as I mentioned, it comes from people. Uh, line, line, line them up for success and, and let them help you figure out how is it we can express this better? How is it we might be able to share that culture uh, in a unique way or a slightly different way? Um, I'm going to talk towards the end about evolving your culture. You know, that journey from a small entity, an entrepreneurial organization to a much larger organization. Um, and it really is important to make sure that your people are on that journey with you. But before I talk about evolving the culture, I want to be honest about some of the common challenges. Um, resistance to change. Like, I know a lot of people that say, oh, change is great. I love change. And usually what they mean is I want someone else to change. I don't necessarily want me to change. Like, my changing is it's hard. Sometimes it can be painful. Uh, it can feel, like I said, it can feel like you're taking things away. I, I might not have the right perspective on it. And oftentimes people fear change because it disrupts us. Um, and we have to adapt to new. We lose some of the comforts of the known. And so it's really important as you are helping people to lean into the change that you be sure to celebrate those small wins, celebrate the progress. Um, I would say also, when you don't have that leadership commitment to building the culture in a certain way, people will feel that. They'll feel that lack of, of support. Um, oftentimes folks can say, well, I know that that's what we, that's what we talk about doing, but this is what I'm going to do. And going back to the definition of culture being behavior and values, when you have that incongruent behavior, it's really important to address that. It's really important to talk through it. Um, and, and make sure that you understand their why. Those conversations are really important to have because oftentimes we can see people that are behaving in some way that isn't congruent with the culture that we're building and make assumptions and tell, tell ourselves stories. And so talking to that person with the assumption that they are a rational, logical human that's doing this for a reason, ask them why. Seek to understand where it is that they're coming from, because oftentimes it's in that understanding with a little bit of patience and persistence sprinkled in, we can help them to see 
where there's alignment in culture and where their actions can align and help to build culture, or in the small case that it's not gonna work, it helps you all to come to an agreement to understand why moving on might be the right thing for them. And then the last one is this inconsistent communication. Um, it is really essential that you effectively communicate. And when there's a lack of consistency and honest communication, people may not understand. And like I said, we tend to make stories. I have a, a friend of mine who has an acronym called NIMSU, N-I-M-S-U. No information, make up. And that's what we do, right? If I don't know, then I'm going to make things up. I'm going to make stuff up. And I will start to tell myself stories. And then I may share my stories with others. So it's really important that we consistently are communicating, even sometimes communicating that we don't know, or here's what we're looking at, or here's what why we can't say what it is uh, we're going to do. Because sometimes for reasons, you can't always share all the information. So just be honest about that. And it becomes really important, especially as you're growing a conscious culture. So we talk about, hey, we have culture. We, have, we want to become more conscious. How do we go about that? What does evolving culture look like? Well, I can tell you it's not easy, but it is really important. And I have a picture of a teacup there because I talk about culture as being like porcelain. It has a strength and a beauty to it, but it can be broken if we're not paying attention. Um, my kids have heard since they were little accidents or what happened when we're not paying attention. And yeah, they're gonna happen sometimes, but we need to be really, really careful with our culture. Don't try and change too much at once. Uh, people showed up and have joined your organization for that culture, for that alignment that you have right now. As you are going through and making changes, like I mentioned, when we were a small uh, enterprising organization, uh, you know, entrepreneurial organization, and we grew into where we are now, there are threads of that heart that still exist. They just may look different. And as you're making those changes, ask others, does this honor our culture? And then honestly, listen to them. As we have been figuring out what we look like at the size that we are, there have been a lot of things that we've talked about doing that didn't honor our culture. And so we said, well, we're not going to do that. We're not going to go in this direction because that wouldn't honor the culture. It wouldn't extend it in a healthy way. And there are always solutions. If you're willing to step back, listen to feedback, and think creatively, there are ways to navigate forward. And also, there's no one size fits all in terms of culture. So I've shared examples with you from our culture don't just copy them because they sounded cool. Figure out what it looks like for you. Uh, if you start doing a 9 a.m. phone call uh, on Monday, it might seem a little bit weird uh, if you just throw people into that. Talk through with other trusted folks in the organization. You know, I mentioned before those trusted relationships where you can get feedback. Uh, I would encourage you to talk through some of those things of, what, what might this look like? How can we implement and live this out? Asking those questions and having those discussions means you can start things even at a grassroots level that ultimately get adopted uh, going up and as the culture grows and expands inside of your organization. And so I'll leave you with the model mindfulness, values, and purpose, all coming together and connecting and helping produce culture. But it's not a set it and forget it type thing. It needs to be cared for and attended to. It needs to be fostered in order to be healthy, like a garden, right? Like growing tomatoes. And when you do that and when you focus on it, 
just like growing a garden, you have this wonderful fruits of your labor that everybody gets to enjoy and everybody can gather around and, and really get behind. And so that for us is how we look at and think about conscious culture. So that kind of wraps up what I was looking to share. I want to say thank you for being here. Um, do we have any additional questions? Sure enough, David. Here's another one. We're always looking for a cultural and technical fit when recruiting someone new. Is one more important than the other for you? And if one of them is not 100% there, which is less difficult to change or improve in your own experience? So cultural versus technical is a great question. Um, folks uh, here in Dallas have heard me talk about when we, when we recruit and when we're interviewing, it's really important that we think about attitudes and aptitudes because those cultural pieces, I can't necessarily teach you. I can't teach you how to be someone who practices accountability. Um, you can have your own behaviors that help you with that, but I can't teach you integrity. I can't teach you motivation. I can teach you technical skills. We can teach you uh, a framework or a language or some practices around the technical side. And uh, it actually is one of the things that we enjoy doing here at Improving, right? The Improving You, uh, you like university program is, is ways to learn those types of technical things. And so I would say the cultural aspects far outweigh the technical aspects when we're talking to candidates. And I think it's important and something that we practice here is in our interviews to talk about our culture, to talk about our guiding principles, our values, and the behaviors that surround those values to make sure that there is a fit. I know in the past when we've hired folks that maybe didn't have that cultural fit, um, we've had some folks that didn't value dedication the same way that we do. And when I say dedication from improving perspective, that's about thinking of others more without thinking less of yourself and that we mindset, not a me mindset. We, we have had folks who showed up with more of that me mindset. They weren't culturally aligned. And ultimately, as they were in our culture, they ended up selecting out because there was that misalignment. So I would say that's another great benefit of having this conscious culture is it becomes very obvious to everyone, whether there's alignment with culture or not. And it helps you figure out who are the right people to be here and who might be somebody that needs to be somewhere else. It's a great question. And it was a great answer. Thank you, David. And we don't have any more questions right now in the chat. I don't know if you want to say something before closing your talk. Well, I just would like to say thank you for coming. And, uh, and I would encourage you continue to think about your company's culture and how you can help it to grow in, and be all that it can potentially be. And if there's any way that I can help you with that or speak to your specific situation, feel free to reach out uh, to me on LinkedIn. I know Armando shared my LinkedIn profile. So feel free to reach out and I look forward to any conversations. Thank you, David. And here uh, to the audience, that's all for today. And as we saw, all companies have a culture, but not all companies intentionally develop a culture that promotes their values and purpose. During David's presentation, he talked about corporate culture and that it's the sum of the values and principles that constitute the social and moral fabric of business, fostering a spirit of trust and cooperation among all stakeholders. I want to thank all of you for joining us today and especially David O'Hara for sharing this amazing presentation. Coming up next week, we have another goodie. It's called Developing a Growth Mindset in the Technical Field with Mark Runyon. Until next time, everyone, have a great rest of the day. Thank you, David.